Coming up on Mississippi Roads, it's classic art. The Mississippi Museum of Art takes its collection on a tour across the state. We take a tour of the Oro Keith Museum in Biloxi, and we feature artist Rick Anderson as he chases his dream. Down Mississippi Road. Hi, welcome to Mississippi Roads. I'm Walt Royson. This week, we're in downtown Jackson at the Mississippi Museum of Art. Now, the museum has put together two exhibitions in honor of the state's bicentennial year. One of them is called Art Across Mississippi, 12 Exhibitions, 12 Communities, in which they're taking pieces from the permanent collection here at the Art Museum, packing them up and sending them out on the road to locations around the state. And that way, people who don't normally have the chance to come to Jackson and see these pieces can see them right there in their own hometown. And we're going to start off this week by taking a look at Art Across Mississippi. Art Across Mississippi is a series of 12 exhibitions that will go out into the state, into 12 different communities over a 12 month period of time from May of 2017 to May of 2018. Um, and these exhibitions reflect various aspects of Mississippi's culture and history as depicted by artists from the past 200 years. The artworks contained in these 12 exhibitions we are sending out across the state as part of Art Across Mississippi are all artworks that we own and we house here in our museum in Jackson. Some of them are usually on display in the Mississippi Story exhibition. Um, others get rotated in and out of those exhibitions and spend some time in our storage vault to protect them from light and other um, climate situations that, that could endanger them. And so this is a great opportunity for us to kind of empty our vaults, so to speak, and share the art with people who don't get to see it on a regular basis. We're an affiliate of the uh, Mississippi Museum of Art, and uh, they provide us with two exhibits every year, and this is one of the exhibits that they were gonna be able to provide us this year and feel very fortunate to have it, uh, especially to start off the, the, the series of the 12 uh, cities they're visiting. There's quite a, a, quite a uh, following for art here in this town and people turn out, turn out for this kind of thing. You know, looking around, uh, you know, you see, well, we see places that are familiar to us and, you know, and places that aren't familiar to us that it's great to see, you know, uh, records of by, by the painters themselves. But I think it just shows this great sort of continuous thread of, you know, beauty and, and the fact that Mississippians have a sense of place and a sense of appreciation for beauty and the, and the exhibit sort of shows that off well. Well, it's a wonderful opportunity for Delta State to showcase our art department and our love for the arts here in, on this campus and in this community, but to bring Marie Hall here from the Museum of Art in, in Jackson and be a part of this whole system celebrating our bicentennial is a great opportunity to collaborate with others who are interested in the arts in Mississippi for a great cause. The idea of uh, traveling exhibits around the state, celebrating the bicentennial, different artists, different collections, different exhibits, uh, all make a lot of sense to give different communities a chance to see some of the great art that our state has produced and we're glad to be a part of that. Seeing museum great work in, in Cleveland is, is a wonderful opportunity for our students as well as for bringing a community to our gallery. Marie Hall has a, a close connection to this area. She was good friends with Malcolm Norwood who was the chair of the art department in the 1970s and donated um, 75 works of art to the university, which became the basis of, of our permanent collection here. A lot of our students think that to, to establish yourself as an artist, you have to leave Mississippi. And Marie Hall showed that you can be, can remain in Mississippi and still be, 
practice as an artist and still stay in tune with what else is going on in, in, in the art world. Like for her, she had a seven decade long career and, and, and you can sort of see how it echoes what is going on in the American art scene in, in, in general. So I think she's a great example and inspiration for, for our students. Well, in a community like Charleston, where most of our citizens may never get to see works like this, to have these sitting right here on our hometown square is just amazing, where people can walk in and see some of the most influential Mississippi artists of our time. There's something about Mississippi that causes time to stand still. Um, and so that's why I think it, it really doesn't change a whole lot. The land is still the same, the farming is still huge. Um, you know, it's, there's a richness about it. And, it. and it's very dear to people. That's why, you know, it amazes me in our community alone how many musicians and artists and writers we have just in this little area. But I think Mississippi just asks for that. Per capita, Mississippi is one of the most creative states, the creative enclaves of land, I suppose, even before there were states uh, that maybe have ever has existed. You talk about the literature and the music, uh, the visual art, of course, the food. Um, and, and I think to, to, to reference a, a musician friend of mine, it's, it's all about, art is all about creating when you don't have a lot of options, when you don't have all the resources you need. It's figuring out how to, how to work around that to find your creative outlet. Um, and so that's what Mississippi is about. We, we certainly have a history that's complicated, uh, but a, lo a lot of really amazing creative output that we've given to the world. Um, and that's all from a little place like Mississippi. And that's a credit to the people of the state. Art Across Mississippi has 12 distinct exhibitions. They're all curated around a different theme, uh, some time in Mississippi art history uh, that we're standing right now in Charleston, Mississippi, and this is Narratives of the Land. Um, but every, every exhibition in every town is going to have a different aspect to it, a different collection from Mississippi Museum of Art's permanent collection. Um, and it's really a viewpoint, a vignette, into why Mississippi art is so important and what it means at this bicentennial crossroads. I teach a lot of youth, and I think that that's where we've got to reach out, you know, and, and find these artist kids that, and as care, give them a place to come create, give them a place to express themselves, and give them a place to see other artists creating and striving and thriving in Mississippi. A lot of our youth in this area would never get an opportunity to travel to Jackson to see these pieces. You know, this is phenomenal for our area. Art Across Mississippi is a precursor to the next in the bicentennial events being produced by the Mississippi Museum of Art in downtown Jackson. That next event is entitled Picturing Mississippi. Which, by the way, Picturing Mississippi is a part of the Annie Laurie Swam Herring Memorial Exhibition Series. Picturing Mississippi gathers over 175 works of art from around the country, back home to Mississippi and downtown Jackson, to illustrate Mississippi's rich artistic legacy over the last 200 years. And hey, on our next story, we're going to visit another museum, the Orr O'Keeffe Museum on the Gulf Coast. Now, you might remember about a dozen years ago, construction on the Orr O'Keeffe Museum was abruptly interrupted by Hurricane Katrina. So we're going to go back and see how things are coming along. And I will tell you this about it. Just like the live oak trees growing outside that were part of architect Frank Gehry's design for the Orr O'Keeffe Museum, all of it is growing back nicely. <music> Well, one of the most unique things about the Oro Keep Museum of Art is that we're right here on the Gulf, across from Deer Island. It's a beautiful, beautiful setting. And on that beautiful setting is probably one of the most remarkable architectural buildings in the whole state of Mississippi. It's designed by Frank Gehry, and uh, it's, it's very, very futuristic. I don't think you're gonna see anything else like it in the state of Mississippi.
Frank Gehry is a collector of George Orr, and he actually has a number of pieces in his studio, and he really looked at those as being a mainstay about how he's going to design these pods. So the pods that you see are really uh, resemblances of his own pottery that are turned upside down. So they have that very, very same twisty kind of quality that's very unique to George Orr. Some people look at this work and uh, they say, well, I've seen this stuff before, but what they don't realize, this was all from the 1890s and the early 1900s. It's very, very special. He's an abstract expressionist in a sense in terms of um, the uh, pottery world. He's very, very famous even outside of Mississippi. He used clay from the Chuticabuff River. And uh, some people wonder if that is the, the aspect that made his work so lightweight and unique. Uh, we don't know, we don't know exactly where he got his clay off the river, but that is where he got it. He would take a boat out there and load up the clay and take it back to his studio. As you can see, these wonderful works of George R. are very, very special and unique. This is why we built this museum, to celebrate the native son of Mississippi as one of the most world famous artists. Well, some of the most famous collectors of George Orr uh, include the great famous painter Jasper Johns, uh, Andy Warhol, and even Jack Nicholson. We're in the uh, Beau Rivage uh, Gallery of African American Art, and this is one of the major missions of the Oro O'Keefe Museum of Art. It's all about cultural diversity. And one of the things we do here in this particular gallery is we celebrate the culture of African Americans here in uh, the Gulf Coast. Pleasant Reed is very important in that he is an important person. He used to be a slave and, and uh, worked his way out of that and became a very, very important person in uh, Biloxi. And we use his house as a celebration of African-American culture. I think one of the most important things to remember about the Oro O'Keefe Museum of Art is that our main patron, Jerry O'Keefe, was a big civil rights activist, and he thought it was very, very important for the museum as its mission to celebrate African-American culture. In addition to fine arts, we also do popular culture exhibits. We've done baseball, we've done a uh, Katrina exhibit, and uh, we'll be coming up with a vintage motorcycle exhibit too. And that's all about trying to attract people uh, that uh, normally don't come to museums. And what happens is they come and they see these po popular culture exhibits, and they also get exposed to art, and uh, they usually always come back. One of the most important things that happened here on the Mississippi coast, of course, was Katrina. And to commemorate that, we have a Katrina exhibit inside one of our galleries. The main points of what we do here at the Oro Keefe Museum of Art are about architecture, art, and education. So our summer uh, art camp program is titled Mud Daubers, and I did not come up with that name, but love it, and so we've kept it all this time. And you know, it has to do with these little mines that are playing in clay, and um, sort of like, I think it was a take on a dirt dauber, but so they're, they're little mud daubers. I do a lot of research. Um, I want to incorporate different mediums in the program, so I don't want it to be, all clay. I like for it to be about 80% clay and the rest mixed media. I look at other projects, I test the projects out, um, and just try to bring a broad spectrum of um, techniques to the program. It's, it's the best art camp I've ever been to. You do pottery, I've never done pottery before. It's really fun. I thought it was just amazing you could make such cool things out of just regular clay that comes from the ground. We do work on the pottery wheel in our camp, and as an homage to George Orr, we do talk about where the clay comes from. Um, we have 12 pottery wheels. They're all on there at one time. It's deliciously crazy, and they, um, they just love it for all of them. It's their first opportunity to get on the wheel, 
And then we do go look at the work of George Orr in the galleries um, and reflect back and look at the colors and we do talk about glazing and uh, the forms that he used. So yeah, really unique experience for them. George Orr's um, creative expression, I mean he was just out there and he did his own thing and we try to do that here. I mean it's certainly not a paint by numbers type of art program. Um, we try to bring in mixed media and let them really explore different tactile services and um, we want each child to find his or her own vision. My favorite thing is making clay sculptures. I take clay, make a small pot, then if I have any leftover clay, I use it and make the legs and um, arms and the eyes with that. Every single camp session, there are extraordinary students with extraordinary talent. Uh, little George Orr's, I think are coming out of this program and we see the same students over and over each year so they're really growing up with us and um, sometimes they walk in and they've grown so much I don't recognize them and then they bring their friends and it's just a really wonderful experience and oftentimes the parents came to Mud Dauber's summer camp here so they're now bringing their children um, so it's just a it's become like a family tradition. What we're doing here today is our Art and Mind program. It's a community-based program for our community members with memory loss programs, and they're coming here to the museum, and we do art programs with them and art activities. George Orr was born in 1857 here in Biloxi, and his dad was a blacksmith, and George just couldn't figure out what to do. They say he had almost 15 or 16 different jobs that didn't work. Well, uh, a friend sent him over to New Orleans and he met a guy named Joseph Meyer, who was actually running Newcomb College, which is now Tulane, and uh, got George involved in clay, and he just found himself. He felt like a duck in water, he said. The message I'd like to leave everybody here about the Oro O'Keefe Museum is that this is your museum. This is our museum. It's about Mississippi. It's about a lot of diversity in terms of culture, art, architecture, and education. We're going to wrap up our show about art and artists with a story about a friend of mine. Rick Anderson lives and works in Clinton. He's a native of the Delta. And in the years that I've known Rick, I've come to understand that being an artist is more than just a profession, it's a lifestyle. The life of an artist, a life consisting of sketching and painting and going to functions and the like. And actually that is a part of it. But as with anything else, there are lots of other things going on at the same time. Car payments, house payments, raising a family, stuff like that, living. But being an artist, a painter in the case of Rick Anderson, is not only a full-time job, it is a lifestyle. And it actually has been for a long time, from even before Rick made the conscious decision to take up art as a profession. Well, probably uh, from my brother, years and years and years ago, and I was probably seven or eight or nine. So that's when I started doing uh, art. I liked it then, of course, it was just fun. My parents always were behind me, and uh, that was when a lot of parents would say, you can't make a career at that. You need to be a doctor or, or a mathematician or something. So uh, I think support from home was always good. I went to Delta State, and uh, as I was majoring in art, I, I asked Dr. Norwood, I said, what direction should I go? Should I, should I maybe go in education or art education or just paint? He said, well, you know, you can, you can go in either direction, but uh, it's up to you. So I chose, uh, I chose to teach because I guess maybe it was a sort of a safety kind of thing. And uh, as I got into teaching, it was so, sort of uh, something that I enjoyed doing, and I taught for 25 years. 
Well, you might say Rick Anderson lost his amateur status while in college because that's when he found he could make money from art. Actually, I used to do pencil portraits at, at, uh, in college to uh, have spending money. And I think I, I, I think I started out $5 a pencil portrait, but of course in the 60s, $5 was pretty good pay. But teaching has its reward also other than monetary. Because teaching, when I talk to students about, about methods, you know, that helps me learn uh, other things. And uh, I think it helps my progression as an artist, uh, sharing with other students. And then when students ask particular questions, when I have to explain to them things that I do naturally, I think that sort of helps what I do. At the high school in Natchez, I had a student ask me once, you know, uh, Mr. Hanson, who makes you work? And I said, well, you know, that's a good question because nobody makes me work. Anyway, of course, I have the students work. I make them work. And uh, I said, you know, the, the, the day that I don't feel like working is probably the day that I don't need to be doing art anymore. Consciously or unconsciously, Rick Anderson is always in two modes, intake and output. Intake in that he's always seen shapes and objects and colors and lights and shadows and the way it plays on itself in a certain way. And he tucks that into his memory or stamps it with his camera as a reference for a painting later. A lot of photographs. And the photographs are for reference. They're not to copy. They're for design, uh, distance, shape, and, and contrast as I'm working. So I may combine elements of a variety of photographs into one painting. And also, a lot of it, sometimes when I'm painting, I don't reference photographs. I re reference the experience that I had throughout this whole ex lifetime of paying attention when we travel. Even though Rick Anderson has retired from the classroom, he still teaches, still eagerly shares his techniques that he's collected over the decades in seminars and retreats, and even in the classroom still, in school visits. Yes, I do. I do workshops. You know, once you're a teacher, you're always a teacher. And I might say, every once in a while, I'll get an email from a student I taught in high school asking questions. So I think once you start teaching students, you're always their, edu their teacher. However, his passion is putting a creation on canvas and making it come alive in texture and light and shadow and shapes. I feel like my career is stronger than it's ever been. And, you know, I've had a lot of good success. And of course, with success, you have not success. But I think my art is as strong as it's ever been. And hopefully it will even get stronger. And that's because I can take my time, I can work, I can apply, apply what I know to my paintings and then I evaluate paintings. A lot of times when I'm creating a, a, a painting, a lot of time is spent sitting back and just looking. I do something, I sit and look. And then not only do I do that, but I'm, I think subconsciously thinking about a particular piece as I'm working on it. So things come and things go, things change. And I think it's a whole, the whole element of everything involved to create a piece of artwork. So the life of an artist is not just leisurely sketching and frittering away time. It's the life of a business person, an accountant, a one-man public relations agency, a pitch man, a handyman, and a poet. It's the poet part, the visual poet in this case, that gives you the energy to do the mundane other parts. And it's that inner drive the drive you've had since you were a kid, the drive you didn't even know you had until it surfaced, that's the reason for all of it. The drive to create, to express your inner self in a visual way, the drive to do so even if you didn't get paid to do so. That is the life of an artist. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. If you'd like information about anything you've seen, contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads or 
like our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson, and I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. <laughs>